Fountainhead was considered to be her philosophy as made evident in the life of one man. That man was Howard Rourke, a brilliant young architect who was expelled from the Stanton Institute of Technology for refusing to go by its outdated traditions. He leaves to New York City to work for Henry Cameron, a disgraced architect whom Rourke admires. The two men form a close bond, with Rourke eventually becoming more like a son than an employee. Rourke's highly successful schoolmate, Peter Keating, also moves to New York to work for a prestigious architectural company, Franken & Hire. The differences between the two groups are apparent, as Rourke and Cameron create fantastic work, but their projects rarely receive recognition, whereas Keating's ability to flatter and please by building whatever his clients want brings him almost instant success, despite lacking originality. Because I'm going to give the public what it wants. Rourke won't compromise his drawings and his ideals to the that whims of his clients, and he ultimately right. makes the decision to close his office. I'd rather work as a day laborer if necessary. He takes a job at a Connecticut granite quarry owned by Guy Franklin, whose beautiful, temperamental, and idealistic daughter Dominique is trying to woo Peter Keating. While Rourke is working in the quarry, he encounters Dominique, who has taken an extended holiday in the same town as the quarry. There is an immediate attraction between them, which results in a peculiar flirtation and ultimate culmination in what Dominique subsequently describes as rape. Ellsworth Toohey, a columnist for the New York Banner, is an outspoken socialist. Artistic value is achieved collectively by each man subordinating himself to the standards of the majority. Who is covertly rising to power by shaping public opinion through his column and his circle of influential associates, and whose quite openly proclaimed designs are not understood or taken seriously. Tui sets out to destroy Rourke, whom he sees as a great symbol of everything he intends to subdue through a smear campaign. Dominique believes that greatness such as Rourke's should never be offered to a public unable to appreciate it, and decides that since she cannot have a world in which men like him are recognized for what they are, she will live a completely and entirely in the world she has, which shuns Rourke and praises Keating. Despite this, Rourke continues to attract a small but steady stream of perceptive, intelligent clients who see the value in his work. To win Keating a prestigious architecture commission offered by Gail Wynand, the owner and editor-in-chief of the banner, Dominique agrees to sleep with Wynand. Wynand then buys Keating's silence and a divorce for Dominique and Keating, after which Wynand and Dominique are married. Wynand subsequently discovers that every building he likes is done by Rourke, so he enlists Howard to build a home for himself and Dominique. The home is built and Howard and Gail become great friends, though Wynand does not know about his past relationship with Dominique. Now washed up and out of the public eye, Keating realizes he is a failure. Rather than accept retirement, he pleads with Tui for his influence in favor of for Keating to get the commission for the much sought after Cortland housing project. Keating knows that his most successful projects were aided by Rourke, and he knows Rourke is the only person who can design Cortland. Before we were born, I've never had an idea of my own. I've fed on you and hated you for it, and I've come here to ask you to save me. Rourke agrees to design it in exchange for complete anonymity and the agreement that it would be built exactly as he designed. My work done my way. Nothing else matters to me. When Rourke returns from a long yacht trip with Wynand, he finds that, despite the agreement, the Cortland Homes project has been changed. Rourke asks Dominique to distract the night watchman and dynamite the building to prevent the subversion of his vision. The entire country condemns Rourke. Man can be permitted to exist only in order to serve others. But Wynand defends him in his newspaper. After a long-fought campaign on both sides, Wynand is eventually faced with the choice of closing in the paper or reversing his stance and agreeing to the Union demands. He gives in, and the newspaper publishes a denunciation of Rourke. At the trial, Rourke seems doomed, but he rouses the courtroom with a speech about the value of ego and the need to remain true to oneself. It had to be said. The world is perishing from an orgy of self-sacrificing. I came here to be heard. In the name of every man of independence still left in the world, I wanted to state my terms. I do not care to work or live on any others. My terms are a man's right to exist for his own sake. The jury finds him not guilty. Wynand, who has finally grasped the nature of the power he thought he held, asks for it to design one last building, a skyscraper that will testify to the supremacy of man. Build it as a monument to that spirit which is yours and could have been mine. A brief epilogue 18 months later shows the Wynand building well on its way to completion. The last scene follows Dominique, now Mrs. Rourke, entering the site to meet Rourke atop the steel framework. 
The novel in which Rand's philosophy is most apparent, however, was Atlas Shrugged. As the novel opens in America at some unspecified future time, protagonist Dagny Taggart, executive of the railroad company Taggart Transcontinental, attempts to keep the company alive in difficult economic times marked by collectivism and statism. Dagny's brother, James Taggart, the railroad's president, seems peripherally aware of the company's troubles, but will not make any difficult choices, preferring to avoid responsibility for any actions. While this unfolds, Dagny is disappointed to discover that Francisco D'Anconia, her childhood friend, first love, and king of the copper industry, appears to have become a worthless playboy who is destroying his own business. She meets Hank Reardon, a self-made steel magnate of great integrity, inventor of a metal alloy called Reardon Metal, whose career is hindered by his feelings of obligation towards his wife, and whose business is in danger of coming under government control and Dr. Robert Stadler, a physics professor who is a creator of the State Science Institute, intended to release science from the demands of its capitalist sponsors, delivering it instead into the control of bureaucrats and politics. Dagny also becomes acquainted with Wesley Mooch, a Washington lobbyist who leads the government's efforts to control all commerce and enterprise, and Ellis Wyatt, founder of Wyatt Oil. While economic conditions worsen and government agencies gain increasing control over successful businesses, helpless people repeat the saying, who is John Galt, meaning don't ask important questions because we don't have answers. Dagny learns that the nation's innovators and business leaders are disappearing one by one under mysterious circumstances. Dagny and Hank find the remains of a motor that turns atmospheric static electricity into kinetic energy along with the evidence that the atlases of the world, its prime movers, seem to be disappearing due to the actions of a figure she calls the Destroyer. While searching for the motor's creator, Hank and Dagny begin to experience the futility of their attempts to survive in a society that hates them and resents their motivation and their ability to create and achieve. In the final section of the novel, Taggart discovers the truth about John Galt, who is leading an organized strike against those who use the force of law and moral guilt to confiscate the accomplishments of society's productive members. She falls in love with Galt, who has taken all of the brilliant minds of the world to a hidden valley, Galt's Gulch. With the collapse of the nation and its rapacious government all but certain, Galt emerges to reconstruct a society that will celebrate individual achievement and enlightened self-interest, delivering a long speech, 56 pages in one paperback edition, serving to explain the novel's theme and Rand's philosophy of objectivism. He explains that the thinkers of the world would only return when men were once again free and collectivism was dead.